ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this evening's semi-final debate. My name is Matilda Graper and I'm the chairman of this debate. The timekeeper is Kate Atkin. This debate will be judged by a panel of three adjudicators, who are Mr Patrick Moritz, Ms Manfield and Dr Sean Jolly. The topic of this debate is that the defence is too remote. Um, the affirmative team sits to my right from St Peter's Girls, and the negative team sits to my left. See this to my left is from St John's. The speaking time of this debate is eight minutes. A single warning bell will sound one minute before the speaking time, and a double bell will sound at the speaking time. Please ensure that your mobile phones are switched off. Good evening, Madam Chairman, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Zara and I'm the first affirmative speaker for tonight. The topic of tonight's debate is that the defence is too remote and we as the affirmative team strongly concur with this statement. Before I begin, I'd like to define some key terms that we will use throughout this debate. We define defence as a case presented by or on behalf of the party accused of a crime or being sued in a civil lawsuit and the term remote as having very little connection with or relationship to. We define an applicable case of the extreme circumstance law as when a person that is not criminally responsible for an act done under such circumstances of sudden or extraordinary emergency that an ordinary person possessing ordinary power of self-control could not responsibly be expected to act otherwise. We would also like to specify that the cases we are looking at in this debate are only those that have occurred in Australia. As first speaker tonight, I'll be discussing Emma Dorge's case and the idea that the extreme circumstance law is not applicable in this situation. And I will then move on to explain that if the activists want to win this case, they have to prove that blocking the Brisbane roads was our last option and they cannot be expected to act otherwise. Our second speaker, Stella, will talk about how applying the extreme circumstance law to this case is not a sustainable solution and is in fact a dangerous solution leading to more extreme situations. She will also explain that Emma's defence is that she wanted to initiate government action. However, her protest will have no big impact, providing similar circumstances which have seen this outcome. Our third speaker, Emily, will rebut and sum up our team's case. Moving on to my first point that the defence is too remote because the ext extreme circumstance law should be used in just that, an extreme circumstance, which are causing immediate danger. In order to fully dissect and understand this controversial topic, you need to consider the reason that the Extraordinary Emergency Act exists. It is intended for the defendant to prove that he or she acted as they did because of the stress of a sudden extraordinary emergency and for the prosecution to satisfy you beyond reasonable doubt that they did act in this way to ensure the safety of someone else. It is likely to be argued when someone breaks a road rule so they can save a life, for example. This has been used for centuries in many countries under emergency circumstances, yet has never been implied in Australia, and Emma Dorge's case is the first one to exploit this law in court. Not only has this law never been used in an Australian court, so it is extremely difficult to enforce, but climate change in its most general form is not an extreme circumstance, and in this case, no one was in immediate danger. The law is in place to protect people that act in a way to save or help another human. And while Emma claims that we're in the midst of a crisis, and that's a climate crisis, we believe we've essentially been forced to break the law to avert a far more catastrophic outcome. Protesting for climate change will give a solution that won't be implemented for years. Um, and therefore, no law should be broken. And if you believe that climate change protesting passes the Extraordinary Emergency Act, then think about how many other different people in different circumstances would not be prosecuted for their actions. It would go against the fundamentals of court. Look at an example by Edith Morton, a university graduate with a PhD in law. She took the broad idea of inequality between men and women and applied the extreme circumstance law, where a possible yet extremely outrageous solution would be to murder thousands of highly paid men so more jobs were available to women. To sum it up in her own words, you were then agreeing to the fact that it is right to commit a mass murder of all of the men in the world 
to promote female equality as an act of emergency, which is evidently unreasonable. It is blatantly obvious how preposterous this case would be. However, it is no different to Emma's. Thus, her circumstance should not pass the extraordinary emergency law. Moving on to my second point, that the defence is too remote because blocking of roads was not the last option available to the protesters. According to the Australian Law Court, the extraordinary emergency law can only be used if the defendant cannot be expected to act otherwise, as in, there are simply no other options available. An example of this, according to Dr Nicole Rogers from the School of Law at Southern Cross University, was a shipwreck of the late 20th century in which a group of sailors resorted to cannibalism and killed the weakest member of their crew in order to survive. The crew were not prosecuted for the murder on the basis that it was an extreme emergency and the life of one was sacrificed for the good of many. However, in Emma's case, protesting in the street and violating traffic laws and road rules is not the only option available to climate change activists. Therefore, proving the defence is too remote. Rather than blocking roads and distracting daily commuters, climate change activists have the option of contacting government persons, signing petitions, or participating in organised protests. An article in the ABC showcased several individual <coughs> acts of road blocking this year, in which a defendant argued that they should not be prosecuted due to their actions were the last thing available to them. In most of these cases, climate change activists were found physically gluing themselves or other objects to the road, disrupting traffic. Again, they use the same defence as Emma. They should be able to use extraordinary emergency laws to, uh, due to road blocking being their last option. I think we can all agree here that gluing yourself to the road is not the last means of protest available. And an Earth Day organisation outlined possible actions that everyday citizens can complete in order to combat global warming and climate change whilst raising awareness in a safer manner. Things such as drives to secondhand clothes and technology, educational blogs on reducing carbon footprint, or simply writing to the local community or council are all ways that inform the public and urge them to take action, demonstrating that blocking the roads is not the last option available. The BBC supports this idea, saying the most effective strategies are not, surprisingly, doing people to the road or blocking traffic. The fact that the actions taken by climate change activists such as Emma Dorch were not the last option available in the circumstance support the idea that the defence is simply too remote and would not succeed. So, ladies and gentlemen, in conclusion, it is clear that Emma Dorch should be prosecuted for her unlawful actions and not be protected under the Extraordinary Emergency Act due to protesting not being an immediate resolution to climate change and blocking the road was not the last option available to the protesters. In this case, the defence is purely too remote. Thank you. Good evening, Madam Chairman, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Ben Ransom and I'm the first speaker for the negative team. The topic for our debate tonight is that the defence is too remote and being the negative team, we strongly disagree with this statement. Now, we disagree with some of the definitions provided by the affirmative team and would like to redefine some of these key points. The affirmative team defined remote as very little connection or relationship to and we would like to redefine this as not having a reasonable chance to, to prevail in court once the merits of the defence's argument have been evaluated. We would also like to reiterate that this case is not limited to Australia, as the affirmative team suggested. 
as precedents from similar cases in the UK have had an influence on results of this case in Australia and will have uh, an influence on the results. Now our definition is superior to that provided by the affirmative team as it allows for these precedents to be considered and it is also more specific to the case presented by Emma Dorge. Now I would like to rebut some of the main points presented by the affirmative team. Speaker number one said that no one is immediate danger um, due to climate change and there is therefore um, no threat to Emma's health. Now the Australian Medical Association states that climate change will cause higher mortality and morbidity from heat stress, um, higher injury and mortality from severely increasing weather events, increases in the transmission of vector-borne diseases, food insecurity resulting from declines in agricultural outputs, and a higher incidence of mental ill health. In 2015, the World Health Organization also declared climate change as the greatest threat to global health in the 21st century. It is utterly indisputable that climate change has a huge threat to Emma Dorge and therefore is an extraordinary emergency. Speaker number one also said that there was no need to block the roads and that Emma could have instead contacted government officials um, and organised um, protests. Now, this is true, but as our second speaker, Alex, will reiterate, peaceful protesting does not achieve any results. Um, while civil disobedience has been shown time and time again to achieve more results than peaceful protesting. This is evidenced through the actions of uh, Gandhi and Rosa Parks, who stood up against regimes and brought about change through their, um, their civil disobedience. Now, as the negative team today, our team will present a multitude of arguments to justify why the defence was not too remote. As first speaker today, I will discuss that climate change is an extraordinary emergency as the government are not taking adequate action. Um, furthermore, I will confirm how citizens have the right to take extraordinary action if they believe their actions are justified. Our second speaker, Alice, will confirm the importance of civil disobedience in initiating societal change and the non-biting precedents for a similar case in the UK. Our third speaker, Max, will then rebut and summarise our team's argument. Now to my first point, that climate change is most certainly an extraordinary emergency, which the government is not taking sufficient action against. Scientific, scientific corporations like NASA have known for decades that global warming is destroying the environment through increased temperatures, rising sea levels, animal extinction, and animal extinction. But recent information also suggests that it is a huge detriment to human health. Earlier this month, the Australian Medical Association joined other health organisations around the world, including the American, American Medical Association, the British Medical Association and the Doctors for the Environment Australia in recognising climate change as a serious health emergency. On the basis of their irrefutable scientific evidence, the Australian Medical Association states that climate change will cause higher mortality and morbidity from heat stress, injury from weather events, transmission of vector-borne diseases, food insecurity and increases in mental ill health. These effects are already being observed in Australia and internationally. In 2015, as I said earlier, the World Health Organization declared climate change as the greatest threat to global health in the 21st century. This is a clear example that climate change is an extraordinary emergency, as it has been internationally recognised by myriad credible scientific organisations as a grave and mortal threat to human health. Given the magnitude of this climate emergency, you would think that the government would go to extensive lengths to ensure its effect are negated. However, this is not the case. At the 2015 Paris Climate Summit, Australia set a goal to lower emissions by 26 to 28 per cent um, from 2015 levels to 2030. According to the South, the Sydney Morning Herald, Australia is far from these targets as our greenhouse gas emissions for 2018 have risen for the fourth year in a row. The internationally renowned climate action tracker has even branded Australia with an insufficient rating in regards to climate policy, as well as the Climate Council publicly criticising the government for recycling their ineffective climate policies. Additionally, a group comprising some of Australia's most senior military figures and heads of the federal government's biggest departments has formed, dubbed the Secretary's Group on Climate Change Risk, according to ABC News. 
This group was, was formed on the belief that the government are not prepared for climate change and they have made multiple attempts through peaceful protesting to change this, but to no success. Ladies and gentlemen, despite the overwhelming surplus of Australians who are pushing the Australian government to change climate change on their to raise climate change on their priority list, the government have failed to take sufficient action. It is clear that Emma Dorge's defence was not too remote, as the climate emergency is an extraordinary emergency, which peaceful protests will simply not remedy, as shown by the efforts of the Secretary's group on climate change risk. My second point is that Emma Dorge's defence was not too remote, as she had the right to take extraordinary action against the climate emergency, as she believed her act actions were justified. In the Queensland Government Supreme and District Court Bench Book, it states that a person is not criminally responsible for an act or omission done or made under such circumstances of sudden or extraordinary emergency that an ordinary person possessing ordinary powers of self-control self could not reasonably be expected to act otherwise. As previously established, the Government's lack of action in stopping a force which will induce mortality and morbidity gave Emma no choice but to take immediate action as she recognised that civil disobedience was the only way to bring about change, given the government's pitiful history in addressing climate change. This means that, Evan, if, uh, this means that Emma's defence is not too remote, as she believes that there is an extraordinary emergency, and that her actions were justified due to this belief, as she thought it were the proper course of action. And now, even if the opposition's definition of too remote is upheld, this point is still valid, as Emma's defence is likely to prevail and not fail on, her, on the basis of, a, of her belief that it was the right course of action. So in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, Emma Dorge's extraordinary em emergency defence is certainly not too remote. Due to the health effects of climate change, Emma's belief that her actions were necessary and the government's insufficient attempts in dealing with climate change. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Chairman, ladies and gentlemen. As you may have already heard, the topic for tonight's debate is that the defence is too remote. We, the affirmative team, completely agree with this statement and believe that the reasoning Emma, Emma Dorge is bringing to court in regard to the extreme circumstance law is completely inadequate and not valid for her case. Before I begin my debate, I would like to point out some flaws in the opposition's argument. The first negative speaker has tried to tell you that Ms Dorge's protest was a plea for the government to act and therefore she shouldn't be prosecuted. However, the government might notice the, the activists because they are disrupting traffic but, as I will discuss in my debate, huge amounts of attention rarely result in government action. Additionally, Ms. Dorge's actions give climate change activists a bad name because of the way they are going about raising awareness. James Deacon of the ABC wrote that protests are more likely to push politicians away rather than benefit the cause protested for. If Ms. Dorge's aim is for governments to act, their law-breaking pro protests are not an effective process proving that de the defence is too remote. The opposition has tried to rebut our definition by correcting our definition of remote and specifying that the case doesn't relate only to Australia. We would like to agree with their new definition of remote but disagree that the case relates to UK cases as we are dealing with Australian law. However, we agree to um, re rebut to the uh, opposition's argument. The first negative speaker has tried to tell you that climate change is an emergency or crisis. 
We believe this is false because the emergency law can only be used in circumstances when a life is in immediate danger and there is no other option available. We acknowledge that climate change is a prevalent issue in society, however, it is not an immediate crisis in this case. Climate change is not so much an immediate issue, but rather a slowly increasing issue, and Australia has not identified climate change as an emergency, so this law should not apply to Ms Dorja's case. The first speaker has tried to tell you that climate change is extraordinary and government is not, is not taking action. As stated by our first speaker, we are not dismissing that climate change is a current issue, but what defines an extraordinary emergency is that the issue will cause immediate danger and by protesting, an immediate solution will be made. In Emma's case, this is not true and therefore does not com uh, comply with the Act. Now I will begin my debate by addressing one of the biggest problems with Ms Dorge's defence, which is her claim that, actions, that her actions are a retaliation towards the government that will force them to comply with the Extin Extin Extinction Rebellion's request. However, protesting, even when it involves breaking the law, to initiate government action has proven to be almost completely ineffective. The Extinction Rebellion spokesperson, Tom Howell, told ABC News that it was a citizen's duty to rebel. They also claim that their actions are needed to, uh, needed to be done to attract the attention of governments. While it may attract attention, it doesn't initiate change. For almost any modern world issue, such as that of the Amazon fires, the intense political energy on the ground is hugely disproportionate to the practical results of these demonstrations. In fact, government responses usually amount to no more than rhetorical appeasement. More often than not, what happens after a march is that it simply dies out. As is the case for Miss Dorge and the Extinction Rebellion, behind a massive street demonstration there is rarely a well-financed and more permanent organisation capable of following up on protesters' demands to initiate political action that will produce a real change in the environment, in the government, sorry. Moses Nayam, author of more than 10 books and acclaimed leading thinker, describes that there is a powerful political engine running in the streets of many cities. It turns at a high speed and produces a lot of political energy, but the engine is not connected to wheels, and so the movement doesn't move. This analogy highlights the ineffective nature of protests and rallies, not dissimilar to the case in question here. So Ms. Dorge's claim that the law-breaking protests will initiate government movement is simply false. What we as a planet have witnessed in recent years is the mere popularization of street marches and intensification of them, without a plan for what happens next. Evident in the fact that the Amazon forest is still, is still in flames, with no tangible plans to stop the fires anytime soon. I will now discuss my second point, that allowing protesters to violate laws on the account of climate change being an extraordinary emergency is setting a precedence that will cause further disruptions and issues with safety. By allowing even a few protesters to use this defence in court, it would make other protesters feel as though they, can't, they can get away with breaking various laws which will no doubt threaten the safety of civilians. The fact is, allowing this law to be used in court is an unsustainable practice and could theoretically allow any protester to make a claim that their issue is important enough to violate laws set in place to protect society. In doing so, it defeats the purpose of these laws entirely. Laws that ensure peaceful protests are vital in the functioning of our society, and we cannot allow people to undermine them so easily. Our traffic laws are in place to protect the safety of both the protesters and the civilians and to ensure that there isn't too much disruption, especially when the protests concern people in vehicles, which can easily cause a lot of damage. Risks associated with protests include people becoming out of control and civilians resisting and becoming aggressive. Additionally, giving protesters the impression that they can get away with illegal actions could easily lead to more violent and dangerous protests. According to research conducted at the Brain and Creativity Institute at USC, when the issue being protested is moralised, people are more likely to inf inflict violence. And due to the fact that Ms. Dorge's argument relies on people's sympathy for the environment, animals and future generations, people might be more willing to support her un unlawful method of protesting and others like it, leading to an increase in their occurrence. Because of how controversial Ms. Dorge's situation is, she has received massive media attention, meaning her act of moralising law-breaking has reached a lot of people, 
many of whom might support her argument, completely neglecting the fact that it will increase the occurrence of violence, uh, violent protests. By analyzing social media and arrest rates, the researchers at USC stated that a rise in violence at protests may thus reflect the increasing moralization and polarization of political issues in online echo chambers. This means that if people believe the issue has moral significance, they will be more likely to resort to violence to show their support. In Ms. Georgia's case, the approval of the extraordinary emergent emergency defense will undoubtedly allow activists to see Extinction, Extinction Rebellion's protest as morally significant, and thus they are more likely to resort to violence, knowing that it could be justified on the account of climate change being an emergency. Um, the use of the extraordinary emergency defense only gives more protesters the opportunity to use the defense no matter how remote or, or irrelevant it is in their situation. <coughs> so, Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, in conclusion, we the affirmative team strongly agree with the statement that the defense is too remote. Not only is Ms. Dorge's defense and solution unsustainable and unreachable, it is dangerous and harmful to innocent citizens. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, Madam Chairman, Timekeeper. My name is Alexander Matters, and I am the second negative speaker for this debate. Our topic for tonight's debate is that the defence is too remote. As the negative team, we firmly believe this statement to, uh, to be false. Now, I would like to affirm the definition that we, the negative team, have supplied in that we define too remote as not having a reasonable chance to prevail in court once the merits of the defence's argument have been evaluated. As without the case's entire details, of, uh, without the entire details of the case and expert legal opinion, we cannot conclude definitively whether the case would con uh, succeed or not. Furthermore, we believe our definition is more relevant to Emma Dorge's case. Uh, we would also like to reiterate that this case is not limited to Australia, as the affirmative team has suggested. As I will go on to explain, precedents within the UK do have significant legal bearing in Australia. Now I would like to point out the flaws within the negative team's case. Their first speaker has, uh, sorry, their, yes, their second speaker, sorry, has declared that climate change activists are getting a bad name because of their actions. Well, Mandela, Gandhi, Rosa Parks were all highly praised today, but were heavily criticised and lambasted back in their day, indicating that the standards are so that the knowledge we receive in the future will certainly clear them of any wrongdoing. They also uh, claim that protest when breaking the law does not initiate change. This too is false, as we've seen in Hong Kong the power of people movement. Furthermore, the Extinction Rebellion's actions in the UK saw the declaration of a climate emergency by the government. The actions of this very group and their civil disobedience is causing action. Furthermore, they declared that allowing protesters to use the defence could allow anyone to violate laws intended to protect society. These laws and cases are dealt with on a case-by-case -case basis with a rigorous legal system Furthermore, this is irrelevant to Miss George's case, as the court is to evaluate her actions and not those of other protesters. Speaker number two also went to say on that climate change is a slowly increasing emergency, and that the government has not listed it as an extraordinary emergency. Now, climate change may be slow, but the effects are happening now. The increased mortality and morbidity, plus the increases in vector-borne diseases, are already being observed in Australia. 
In terms of it not being listed as an extraordinary emergency, well, this is easily explained. The government are highly invested in coal and fossil fuels, and so have continually reduced CO2 emissions targets in favour of the economic status quo. Climate action trackers have rated Australia as insufficient. Clear that although the Australian government may not recognise a climate emergency, the people and experts do. Now, our first speaker, Ben, has already informed you of the reality of the climate emergency and that despite the calls of various bo expert bodies, the government will not take necessary action. He also spoke to you about how Emma was well within her right to take extraordinary action as she believed her actions were justified. Tonight, I will be speaking to you about the history of civil disobedience and its importance in creating tangible change, as well as the extraordinary emergency defence and how it is applicable in Emma's case. And so my points. The first of which concerns the importance of civil disobedience in creating change. Throughout global history, the actions of individuals and groups in violation of the law has been one of the greatest agents of change. It begins with white landowners opposed to slavery refusing to pay taxes, marking the beginnings of the emancipation of slaves in America. Additionally, one of the most lauded instances of civil disobedience is the suffragettes, with South Australian woman Muriel Matters famously chaining herself to the grill in the House of Commons in protest. Furthermore, Rosa Parks and the Freedom Rides, as well as Dr Martin Luther King Jr's boycotts and marches, were pivotal in the civil rights movements of the 50s and 60s. Civil dis uh, disobedience seen in the Stonewall riots was instrumental in the granting of rights to the American LGBT community, much like Gandhi's civil disobedience saw the end of British rule in India, and the civil disobedience of East Germans saw the fall of the Berlin Wall. The list goes on and on, but the point remains the same. It has been seen time and time again that civil disobedience, much like Emma Dorges in Brisbane, that disrupts the daily goings-on of society, is essential in pushing large, topical issues front and centre and bringing change from reluctant and unwilling governments. The disruption and disorder that arises as a result of civil disobedience gains media attention and public interest, promoting a cause and nearly always creating change. Through the actions, Emma Dorge and her fellow protesters were invested in raising awareness of the issue and they've certainly succeeded. Articles from a multitude of major outlets including the ABC, Sydney Morning Herald, The Washington Post, The Monthly, Korea Mail, Brisbane Times and The Guardian have been published, exposing climate change and the significance of the climate emergency to millions of readers. Furthermore, the actions of the climate protesters have received coverage in worldwide. In fact, the protesters have been so influential as to be a topic for the debating essay semi-finals. <laughs> it is therefore clear, ladies and gentlemen, that their actions are working, drawing attention to the issue and sparking public debate, and working while other means do not. To quote Emma Dorge herself, signing a petition or making a phone call has not caused action to happen. But taking to the streets so that business as usual cannot continue and Brisbane cannot continue to function as a city will mean the politicians will be forced to listen and act. Now, our first speaker, Ben, has already established how hundreds of local government and expert bodies recognise a climate emergency, including the Australian Medical Association, who declared that climate change will cause higher mortality and morbidity, and that despite this chorus of expert voices, the government refuses to take the necessary action. Given these facts, is it not clear that determined civil disobedience, a method that has throughout history, brought the greatest amount of change is not only appropriate, but necessary. Even if we agree to the affirmative team's definition, the point remains compelling as it remains starkly relevant, with her actions having a clear relationship with the extraordinary emergency and the needs under that legislation. So we, the negative team, believe it is necessary, and as a consequence, we believe that the defence of extraordinary emergency is not too remote. And now to my second point, regarding the extraordinary emergency defence and how it is applicable in this circumstance. Now, our first speaker, Ben, has already informed you of the Queensland Supreme and District Court book regards to the defence. To quote Nicole Rogers, doctor from the Southern Law at Southern Cross University, the defence is used by individuals to prevent a greater evil. Famously, in 2008, a case in the Crown, um, in the Crown Court, Greenpeace activists in England were acquitted of wrongdoing after being found to have a lawful excuse for the vandalism of a chimney at a coal plant, causing the plant to close for four days and raising global awareness of the climate emergency. To quote 
the State Library of New South Wales, decisions of superior overseas courts, particularly the superior courts of the UK, as is the Crown Court, are persuasive precedent in Australia. Persuasive precedent is not a precedent a judge is obliged to follow, however it is highly important in reaching a judgement. Additionally, the other options of contacting an MP are not possible. Uh, to quote the Queensland Government MP for Longman, Australian school children should hear from both climate change scientists and climate change sceptics. In fact, John Roskin, Executive Director of the AOPA, a Liberal national, national affiliated think tank, stated that more than 50% of government MPs are solid sceptics. So, ladies and gentlemen, with civil disobedience being extremely important to change and the significant precedent seen in the UK, it is clear that Emma Dorge's case is not too remote. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight I will be arguing that in the, in the case of the climate change activists, the defence is undoubtedly too remote. Tonight I will summarise my team's case, but not before I rebut the opposition's arguments. Tonight the opposition have tried to argue a few main ideas. Uh, one of these is that climate change is an extraordinary, extraordinary event, uh, and Emma did not have any other option but to um, disturb traffic. So the claim that climate change is an extraordinary emergency, um, we have argued against, as our second speaker has argued against, we believe this is extremely incorrect. Um, now we agree with all of the evidence that the opposition have provided about the threat of climate change, however in the context of this law, climate change is not, still cannot be defined as an extraordinary emergency. Uh, we can see this when we compare. Um, the situation at hand to the actual situation from which this law was like derived from. So as our first speaker has explained, this law was inspired by a situation in which shipwrecked people had to eat the weakest members of the crew in order to stay alive. So in this situation, if they didn't eat the other members of the crew, they would have all died, essentially. Um, so, it is... Oh, the, um, law is also used to justify actions of self-defence. But however, in Emma's case, she's losing, using the law to justify protests against climate change. And there are big differences between this case and the actual intention of the law. So firstly, in the um, shipwrecked example, there was no other option but to eat the weakest members. However, in Emma's example, there are plenty of other protesting methods that she could use that um, would be have the same purpose. Also, if the shipwrecked people didn't eat the weakest member, they wouldn't have survived. If Emma didn't have this protest, she still would have survived. And also, there still would have been plenty of other opportunities for us to improve our climate change record. Um, also, um, if the people in the shipwreck didn't do anything at that immediate moment, then they would have died. However, if Emma didn't do anything right now, there's still a lot of opportunities for us to um, treat the environment better and many other opportunities where she can have other protests. It wasn't just that immediate moment where if she did this, the whole world was going to die because of climate change if she didn't do this. Also, um, in the shipwreck example, by committing cannibalism, 
the shipwrecked people um, survived. They completed, they achieved their purpose, which was like to be alive at the end of the day. However, if Emma, even if Emma does this protest, it doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to stop climate change forever. We may make a small impact, but there's no, there's no hard, there's no um, definite evidence that what she does now is, is like a big determinant, will determine our future, the environment's future. So um, this law was created also to allow exceptions in really extreme circumstances. This is not an extreme circumstance. It's a minor traffic event, offence. And while it is nice to think that we can abuse this law for the sake of the environment, that is simply not the case. And it, for this law to function properly, it must be used very specifically. Another main idea argued by the second speaker is the importance of civil disobedience in creating change. Um, and they provided many great examples of um, inspiring leaders, such as Gandhi and Rosa Parks. However, the affirmative, they've also proved to us that these leaders had a positive effect and that civil disobedience worked. However, in the examples that they've provided, the people who protested were punished in the end. Rosa Parks was sent to jail, um, for example, and in none of those examples, the people were allowed to use this defence to get out of jail or, or anything like that. So um, this is just supporting... So whether or not... The, my point is that this is irrelevant to the case, and it can even be argued that it's a, fa a fallacy of a red herring as it distracts us from the actual argument, which is that the defence is too remote. And whether or not, um, whether or not the defence is too remote, the protest that Emma has been in can still have a positive effect. And as the second, affirm, uh, second negative speaker has stated, it did have a positive effect and it has attracted heaps of media attention. So the outcome of the result, whether the defence is too remote or not, is irrelevant um, to the success of the protest. Uh, they've also tried to back up their arguments by saying that Emma Dorges herself says that civil obedience is the best method of protest. However, we believe that's kind of biased. Um, the second speaker has also tried to... Oh, sorry, the, second, uh, the first second speaker has also tried to tell you that um, the first and second um, negative speakers have tried to tell you that Emma's actions were the best way to go about raising awareness. However, there are plenty of other, of up, other options available for climate change activists, which can even be more effective in initiating change. And blocking roads is definitely not the last resort or the last option. And because of this, we believe the defence is too remote. Uh, the first negative speaker have also used many examples and tried to rebut our... Um, cases by saying that climate change is putting lives at risk currently. Um, however, in Mrs. George's cases, case, no one was in immediate danger at the time of her protest, and by by having this protest, she didn't save any lives as a result. And in, in fact, putting being in the protest and blocking roads probably created more immediate danger than climate change. So now I would like to summarise my team's case. Our first speaker began the debate by discussing the details of the case and the Extraordinary Emergency Act. She concluded that not only does climate change not suffice as a sudden or extraordinary act that can be justified with law, but in order for the law to be enacted, blocking Brisbane roadways has to, has to have been the last resort, which clearly it is not. This was followed by our second speaker, who argued that by allowing the use of the Emergency Act in Mrs. George's case, the court is setting a precedence that would suggest further protests can be violated, uh, can violate laws, further protesters can violate laws if they believe their cause is big enough, and how this would lead to violence and entirely defeat the purpose of the laws put in place to protect civilians during protests. She then explained how the protests are not the immediate solution to the issue, and therefore do not fit the legal definition um, of criminal acts completed as a result of sudden or extraordinary emergency. In conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, we, would, we should in no way be allowing the, the use of the Extraordinary Emergency Act. And if we do say that the defence in Mrs George's case is not too remote, we are loosening the legal definitions of the Act. 
and weakening our legal system. Laws such as the Extraordinary Emergency Act must be treated with specificity and only in rare cases in order to utilise its advantages without opening up the opportunity for violations of law in the name of preventing climate change. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, Madam Chairman. My name is Max and I'm the third negative speaker here tonight. The topic for our debate is that the defence is too remote. The defence in question is the extraordinary emergency defence used by Emma Dorge. As the third negative speaker, I'll be summarising my team's case and rebutting the points of the affirmative team. Before I do this, however, I would like to affirm some of the definitions made by our team and explain why they are, in fact, superior. We, the negative team, have defined too remote as not having a reasonable chance to prevail in court. This is the superior definition, as, ladies and gentlemen, none of the debaters present tonight are legal experts, and this is a fair way for us to make a judgment that is not overbearing or beyond our own capabilities. Furthermore, the affirmative team have said that UK law is irrelevant. Australian law is affected by precedents from UK superior courts, including the court that was used in a case is that is highly relevant to ours, a 2008 case, and more recently, a case in the Magistrates Court in Britain. These cases are highly relevant and applicable to our situation. I'd now like to rebut the points of the affirmative team. The affirmative team have all told you that Emma Dorsch's case does not meet the definition of extraordinary emergency as it was not a sudden emergency when no one's life was in explicit danger. Section 25 of, the, of Queensland law uh, in which this defence is stated, notes that the defence can either be sudden or extraordinary. Whilst Emma's case is not sudden, it is indeed extraordinary, as our first speaker, Ben, has shown you. Therefore, it fits the definition. The first and second speakers of the affirmative team have told you that Emma's actions will somehow not be effective. However, as our team has undoubtedly shown, in the past and present, civil disobedience is effective. The most recent example is in Hong Kong, where protesters have just recently managed to revoke a bill that was going to be passed. This is proof that civil disobedience is in fact highly effective. Furthermore, the first affirmative speaker has tried to compare Emma's case to that of a speaker who wanted to commit genocide on men. Emma halted traffic and furthermore did so under the policy of letting emergency vehicles through. This is not the same as committing genocide in any sense. Furthermore, the second speaker has tried to tell you that the government's opinion will not be changed by Emma's actions. As has been shown in Hong Kong and in the many examples of the past, this is demonstrably false. Furthermore, Extinction Rebellion, the exact member Sorry, the exact group that Emma is a part of blocked streets, the exact action that Emma took in Britain, and it had the exact effect they were hoping for. The UK Parliament, after their protest, passed a bill labelling climate change to be instead a climate emergency. What more proof do you need, ladies and gentlemen, that civil disobedience works? Furthermore, they have tried to tell you that Emma's protest is violent, or that it will make way for further violent protests. This is a slippery slope of that fallacy, and demonstrably false. Extinction Rebellion has a policy of letting through emergency vehicles, and, on, and in Brisbane, when Emma's protest happened, 
they later released a letter apologising civilly to anyone whose day was inconvenienced by their actions, however reaffirmed that they were highly necessary. Furthermore, their third speaker brought up the cannibalism case where this defence was first raised in Australia. However, their, by their own definition, Australian However, their first speaker has tried to tell you that there has been no use of this defence before in Australia. So, unless they are talking about a case outside of Australia, to which the affirmative team rebuts the uh, relevance of anyways, this case is entirely irrelevant to our point. Unless they accept our definition that UK law is applicable, or that there were cases previously in Australia. The negative Sorry, the affirmative team have done none of these things. I'd now like to summarise my team's case. Our first speaker, Ben, has established that climate change is undoubtedly real and is caused by humans. He noted that we currently sit at 0 0.9 degrees of warming and that up above 1 degree is inevitable. According to the best climate science, we are currently on track for 3 degrees of warming. Ladies and gentlemen, at this point, crocodiles and other humid living animals that live exclusively around the equator could only survive in the Arctic Circle. He therefore proved that climate change is an extraordinary emergency. He noted the Paris Agreement to limit warming to 1.5 degrees and how the Australian government is woefully behind the track and how Emma and other protesters needed to take action because lives are indeed at stake. After establishing that climate change is in fact a climate emergency, he more importantly revealed to you that it is not up to us to decide whether Emma, sorry, whether we believe that climate change is real or presents an emergency, only that Emma reasonably believed that this was the case. This is all that is needed for her to present it to the court and is all that is needed for her to have a reasonable chance of prevailing, as per our definition. If this is the case, then ladies and gentlemen, it is not up to us to decide whether it will actually prevail. That is up to a judge. Furthermore, our second speaker, Alex, reminded you that civil disobedience works, as I have reiterated multiple times throughout my speech. Emma bravely follows in their footsteps, and in the face of what the third affirmative speaker reminded you, Emma does face jail. So did Rosa Parks and so did other people who achieved results. Our second speaker continued on to say that the history of the extraordinary emergency defence is highly relevant, given a 2008 British case that sets precedence. There was furthermore a case earlier this year which is also relevant. He showed that lawful protest is failing and that we and people like Emma Dorge need to take action for the government to listen, given that they themselves are highly sceptical of climate change, something that our first speaker, Ben, has undoubtedly proven to be real. Ladies and gentlemen, if I were to conclude our case into four brief points, there would be this. One, climate change is undoubtedly real and in fact presents an emergency. Two, the government is not listening or acting. Three, protest is the only available action left. Finally, ladies and gentlemen, lives are at stake. Thank you.